Next, please welcome the group president of Farfetch, Stephanie Fair. Stephanie will be interviewed by Shop Talk's senior vice president of content, Christina Gustafson. some energy to uh, to get the conversation Salsa. started. Well, Stephanie, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, it's very hard to believe that Farfetch was launched 15 years ago. It feels even to me like it was just yesterday, so I can only imagine how, how that feels to you. Uh, you guys really have, though, remained at the forefront of digitization of the industry, so really excited to chat today about how your relationships with consumers as well as your partners are evolving. Yes, it's, it, it has been a journey. Um, I joined in 2016, but yes, Farfetch started in 2008, and in internet years, that would be dog years. <laughs> and I think the consumer has evolved because the landscape has evolved so much. If you think about the fact that the iPhone only launched in 2007, and the customer is becoming, as technology improves, the customer is becoming more sophisticated, um, their expectations are higher. So really, I think that the, the the customer evolution is as a result of the evolution of the landscape, a structural shift to online, and now actually a real expectation that online and offline mm -hmm. communicate. But I think for Farfetch specifically, I think the customer that defines Farfetch is really as a result of the business mm -hmm. model that Farfetch pioneered in 2008. Um, what that was at the time for those uh, of you who don't know, it was really a marketplace that connected boutiques and then later brands through technology to a global audience. So it was a live inventory view of the product that was in store. And this was pioneering at a time when really what was before that was retail online. You buy and you sell. And actually, uh, at the time, I was at Net-A-Porter. I had just been hired to launch the Outnet. So there were sort of two parallel business models. But where that has ch defined to come back to the customer mm -hmm. is that that inventory-less model meant a much broader selection of product, a really broad range, which meant that Farfetch could speak to a much broader audience from the aspirational customer to the, the private client versus the retail model which really is you buy, you have to sell what you buy, and so you're much more targeted about the audience. You can speak to one or two audiences because you have to ensure that that stock um, sells. So I think um, that has defined the customer. And the other one, we talked a little bit about it, is demographics. Um, I, you know, from where I was at the time, I was really marveling at the fact that Farfetch really captured the imagination of a Gen Z millennial customer, and 75% of our customers are millennial and Gen Z. And I came to understand that the reason for that is the business model. It really started as and is a community of boutiques and brands from around the world, multiple points of view. And for a native, digital native customer that's used to social media platforms, the infinite scroll, that those multiple points of view really appeal. The sense that we moved from a place that was incredibly directive in fashion, mm. decided by fashion editors, where they decided what the cool 10 blazers were of the season, to actually a much more community-based, curator-based model, where multiple people decided what was cool. So I think those two things really define um, the, the far-fetched customer of today. Yeah, and it's really interesting to hear you talk about sort of this broad base. It's interesting that they're, they're a quite young consumer as well. But I want to focus on one customer in particular, which is your private client. Um, for those people in the room who aren't uh, as familiar with Farfetch's business, those are their most valuable customers who spend at least $10,000 a year, which I guess in the luxury world is not that impressive, but on my budget that is very, very impressive. Um, so we'll give you kudos for that. Um, but they've been a huge part of your business, and you have been very successful at engaging with them. I have here that your retention for this client has remained over 90%. What's working there? Yes, so it is, it is an audience. I think it's actually an audience we've not spoken a lot about. I think in the grand scheme of everything that is said about Farfetch, it's actually a very large cohort for us, a billion dollars worth of sales from that um, audience, which actually is larger than some of our competitors' entire businesses. Um, and the way we've acquired them is um, through sort of the full funnel, so we might have acquired them through demand generation and moved them up the mm -hmm. tiers. 
um, or we might have acquired them through more traditional means, through offline events and, and curated network moments. But this is an audience that spends at least 12,000, but actually that's the bottom tier of that top tier. And we have an elite customer that spends $500,000 <laughs> a year and above, and we service them very differently. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that. What are you doing that is really sort of keeping these folks um, coming, coming back to you when I, I would imagine they have budget to spend uh, in a lot of different places? Um, and, and that's what makes them private client. They spend <laughs> everywhere there. Um, so, you know, we have to be aware that the private client um, shopper is a very prolific shopper. I always say they're a very promiscuous shopper. They shop everywhere. So their expectations are incredibly high. They um, don't see the difference between their shopping. They will shop on Amazon and expect that level of efficiency and convenience in the luxury space, which is why it's hard to do. Um, but we service them by having a very specific app for them. Um, so a skin and specific experiences with early access to brand uh, moments, special content for them, um, certain capsule collections specific for private client. Um, we do um, perks and services. They get invited to offline events. It really is community around that private client. We assign our very top private clients a stylist. Okay. So we have over 200 human stylists. <laughs> Um, you have to clarify these things. Yes, <laughs> uh, but we're, we're working on, um, on uh, enabling that through technology as well. But we assign them, and um, we offer them a service called Fashion Concierge, which okay. was actually a startup that we acquired quite a few years ago that is a conversational commerce uh, approach to ser uh, bespoke sourcing of products that we can get for them that might not even be on, on Farfetch. So we, we service them very differently because that is what they need. Yeah, that's their expectation, and I'm sure they're getting that experience at a lot of other uh, luxury places where, where they shop. You said something interesting right there, which was moving them up the tiers. Uh, yes. I'm curious how you can tell if someone is a potential high-value customer, what signals are you say, seeing that say to you, hey, this person has a lot of potential to move into that private client range? This is a big focus of our loyalty program access, which is really using signals, and, and Farfetch has a lot of data and a lot of signals, and it's how you employ those. But um, one that we've used for a long time is those triggers that say to you, this will be a potential private client. And in fashion, we know that because um, it is, for example, someone who shops for a ready-to-wear, so an actual clothing item, rather than, say, a small accessory or sneakers. Um, but if it's actually collectible sneakers, we know that they're mm. a potential private client. It's someone who puts more than two items in their basket on the first purchase. That's a more obvious one. Or, and this is where we've really built a lot of expertise at the crossroads of fashion and technology, what are those brands mm. and brand adjacencies that tell you that someone is a private client? And I think um, certain brands will say that immediately. The Row, Kate. Um, these are quiet luxury succession brands. Right. These are the ones that tell you this will be a private client. And so we build that into our algorithms and start to nudge our clients up the, up the tiers. That's really interesting. And I would imagine part of the reason why those brands are, are um, you know, such a good signal to you is it's not screaming with a logo. So you know that these are people who are sort of serious about, uh, about their fashion purchases. Especially now with quiet luxury being yes. such a, a, a moment. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm curious. I, I would imagine you want to keep a lot of things exclusive to this group since they are so high value. But have you seen opportunities to scale some of these offerings to the broader customer base? And, and how is that? working. Absolutely. And I think this is the, the difference with luxury. Um, I've always said you start from the top. Mm. You start from the top and everything um, flows down from there because of the just the sheer expectation and level of quality required by that customer. And eventually, um, that it, those are demands and expectations for all customers, right? In an ideal world, you would want to offer every single customer a private client experience. We can't necessarily do that through human interaction or people or manual processes, but we can do it through technology. So we, um, you know, Fashion Concierge is a good example. We start with, you know, assigning a stylist to a very um, specific uh, customer. A stylist might have, you know, 
a, a, a small number to, in the tens of customers, but actually we can scale that through technology and we're starting to have um, technology-enabled styling mm -hmm. services to open it up to the lower tiers, which might actually give us an indication of who might need a human right. stylist. So and is that video, so it's, it's over video experience that those are happening? Um, you know, they used to happen in person, but yeah. COVID changed that a lot, and, uh, and a lot of it is through video now as well, a lot through WhatsApp. I mean, oh. it, one of the things we always say is be where the customer is, so use whatever channel the customer wants to. So if they want to, you know, buy through WhatsApp, we do it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, uh, let's stick with, with WhatsApp, because I want to ask you also about your app. I realize WhatsApp is not your app, but, but it feels like a, a natural enough segue. Um, it's really interesting to me that you guys have talked about this being your most profitable, but also your fastest growing channel. I think that part in particular, just given apps are, quite frankly, nothing new these days. Uh, what's behind your success there? I mean, I think just in general, an app um, is a bit self-selective because by definition, someone who downloads an app is already someone who is going to engage with you. They've decided that they want something on their phone because they will come back. It costs more to, get a, a, to acquire a customer through app, but actually their long-term value over time mm -hmm. is, is higher. And so we've invested a lot over the last few years in really um, um, sort of diversifying our channels and moving customers to app because we can just offer a much faster, more efficient, more engaged experience, a lot more content. And so um, app is really important. Some countries are pretty much app only. China, if you think mm -hmm. about it, app, WeChat. Um, some are g getting there. The Middle East is, is, is very much a sort of app mobile uh, economy. Some, some markets less so. Yeah. But uh, it's definitely a, a, a channel that we invest in. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear about the regional differences that mm -hmm. you're seeing. I want to shift gears, uh, being mindful of time, uh, and talk about your brand partners. Because as you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, they've really been a key behind your model from the beginning. So how are you seeing your relationships with, with your partners evolving? Absolutely, and, and we would be nothing without our brand partners. By definition, Farfetch is a marketplace, and it's, uh, it's, it's supply and demand, and, um, and that creates a very strong flywheel between the, the supply and the partners we have and the customers we have. That's the Farfetch marketplace, but Farfetch is, group is much more than that. It's the marketplace, it's Farfetch platform solutions, which is a technology enabler for the luxury industry to really move towards that mission of being a platform for the luxury industry and helping to digitize mm -hmm. the luxury industry. And we have NGG, which is uh, our brand, brand platform, which enables sort of culturally relevant brands. So I think in terms of our relations, um, ships with brands, it really has been um, a matter of enabling these brands to develop their strategies and where they want to go. But I think more importantly, Farfetch has actually led the way on pushing these luxury brands to move in a certain direction. The, the sort of pioneering innovation of Farfetch was that sort of um, inventory-less technology um, that allowed sort of direct connection right. to, to inventory. That is something that brands are adopting increasingly as they move to more direct consumer right. uh, models. So they're moving specifically for the top end of the industry. They want more control. Yeah. So they're moving away from wholesale. Definitely wholesale is still very important, but it's important in a targeted way around marketing, but they're moving to direct-to-consumer channels. And Farfetch is their channel. Right. It is a direct-to-consumer. So we're really um, enabling that, and we're allowing um, through our entire ecosystem across our platform to help brands to move their strategy, whether it's through connected retail, so physical and online experiences, um, whether it's through being a transactional channel, a media platform for right. them, um, or helping them internationalize. We can get, you know, 15 languages up for them when in the past brands would have to open a website in the U.S. and then think about their German website. Yep. And we, we can do that from day one. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Well, I'm sure uh, you can't say much about this, but what kind of interviewer would I be uh, if I did not ask you about the pending acquisition of Uxnet Porte? Obviously still undergoing some regulatory review, but in your mind, uh, what's the big prize if, if that succeeds? So yeah, very little I can say. It's moving through the regulatory uh, process, but I think just, you know, the thesis behind um, the deal was really that the luxury industry and more broadly the retail industry is very, very large. And we're big believers that 
um, the customer should and has multiple ways of shopping. And so if we can continue to enable that, whether it's through boutiques or through different, more curated models, we absolutely should. And um, where there's a real opportunity is the complementarity and Farfetch can really enable um, that business and, and Richemont, which is part of the deal, through technology. So, um, so yes, there's, there's an opportunity. Yeah, that, that counts. That counts as an answer. I, th I think that, that was meaningful. Um, but we'll, we'll, of course, be keeping an eye to see if, if, that, uh, if that goes through. Um, I do want to shift gears, though, and talk about retail media. You talked uh, briefly about your media solutions. Of course, just heard quite a bit about that um, from Wouter and Selma. Huge opportunity, huge transformational moment for the industry overall. And I, I think a lot of what we've been seeing on this front has really been in the grocery, uh, grocery space specifically. So talk to me a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing here and, and how it can be different for Farfetch and, and really luxury overall. Yes, yeah, so I think, um, you know, we call it media solutions, retail media. There's a playbook for that. Let's, let's be clear. I mean, Amazon, um, Tmall, Alibaba, I mean, there's, there's a real playbook to leveraging large-scale audiences and monetizing them uh, to the benefit of, of, of partners. Absolutely. But as with everything, um, and why, um, you know, the, what Farfetch has done is so unique, is that you have to adapt that model and think about it in the luxury space. So absolutely there's a programmatic component to it. How can we um, leverage the 40 million views um, uh, and, and really help that for transactional purposes? So at the bottom of the funnel, we do that and we're investing in that. But actually what we've really seen is that brands are looking to us for brand building um, partnerships. Interesting. Because they have been also experiencing this seismic shift in the marketing landscape where the traditional channels for marketing are just not what they used to be and just don't have the ROI that they, they used to have. And so Farfetch offers an amazing opportunity for a walled garden of luxury only first party data that allows them to build their brand mm -hmm. um, with a customer that is already there with intent, intent to learn about the brand and intent to shop. So where we've um, built our media solutions business is really through this idea of brand building and partnership aside from the programmatic. So, you know, a good example is um, Valentino, for example, who came to us, um, they, uh, they had their uh, pink PP collection, which if um, any, anyone knows, it's, it's sort of that Barbie core, very, very pink fuchsia collection. And they were telling that story in a very specific way, as a brand does. Brands become luxury brands because they are so specific. But they wanted to partner with Farfetch to tell that story with a Farfetch lens. And in the same way, they partner with other partners, but Farfetch allows them to do that at scale, and not just for one audience, but for multiple audiences, that sort of breadth of customer that I was talking about. And so we did a takeover, we um, did live stream, we created exclusive product, we shot the campaign, obviously in partnership with Valentino, but we shot it with a far-fetch lens. And so brands are coming to us um, in order to really um, help them launch products mm -hmm. or tell their story in an arm's length way that contributes to the sort of uh, ecosystem of storytelling. Um, Ferragamo is another example. We signed a multi-year 360 degree partnership with Ferragamo um, because they came to us with a problematic, which is how do we um, relaunch our brand and bring it into a new generation of customers. And so we did everything from bespoke content to live stream to a really cool sort of generative AI moment during their runway show where we um, showed our customers these incredible colors based on the runway product that was coming um, down, the, down the catwalk. And so um, these are the opportunities and we can really service uh, these brands across our ecosystem from a content and marketing perspective, from a technology perspective, we're replatforming Ferragamo, we've just launched their EU site, from a modular perspective, some brands come to us just for logistics, mm -hmm. for example. So we really have the, the full ecosystem. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk about it in particular as it pertains to um, the brand billing piece and also just how high touch you're being with your partners because I think that's something that's that's really unique uh, to the luxury space, but I could definitely see sort of scaling um, to, to other parts of the industry. We are quickly running out of time, so I want to just make sure we have a little bit of time to double click on something else you were just talking about because you mentioned it twice, uh, which was live stream. Um, it feels like that was sort of the bell 
follow the ball maybe uh, last year or two years ago, and it's gotten to be a little bit more uh, put under the microscope, so to say, uh, over, yeah. over time. Um, what's working for you there? What are the challenges that companies still face? If you had any advice to folks about sort of how to leverage video and, and live stream, what would you say? I mean, I think in general with technology, um, there's a real sort of pressure to go with the latest fad. And I think particularly in the luxury space, um, you, you almost have this, this sort of framework that forces you and focuses you to think customer first. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just adopting tech for tech's sake, but really thinking what are the use cases and what are the customers. Livestream in China works really well. It's very much a QVC type approach. It's quite transactional. In the rest of the world, it's catching on more slowly, but actually it's perhaps less transactional and more as an engagement tool. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually are seeing increasing success with Livestream and we're um, developing it. We started weekly, bi-weekly, we're now doing many more and really thinking not so much the technology, but what is the content? Mm -hmm. Certain content works, others not. But I think this is just a lesson in general. Um, there's no one silver bullet of technology, particularly in the commerce world where people want everything. You just have to do a bit of it all to really give the customer a full sort of service. Yep. And I would guess there are also probably some opportunities to use this uh, technology for sort of exclusives or, or some of the things that you were talking about earlier in the conversation. Early access, yep. exclusives. We bring uh, designers. We did that with Albert mm -hmm. Vaz and Olivier Roussin from Balmain. We bring them. They, they can talk to customers. Sometimes we do it just for our private clients. Sometimes we do it uh, more, more large scale. Great. Well, at the risk of getting the hook, uh, I have just one more question for you. Um, we've talked a lot about sort of uh, your, your consumer. We've talked about your brand partners, but there are a lot of entrepreneurs in our audience, um, several hundred, uh, quite frankly, founders and CEOs. And you also uh, moonlight as an advisor at Felix Capital, which is a, a very uh, well-respected uh, VC firm. So I, I thought maybe a good place to wrap this would just be what advice you have for the founders and entrepreneurs in the audience who are leading businesses in really disruptive times. Um, yes, it's, it's interesting. Disruptive and uncertain times are also times when we've seen some of the best businesses um, being built because that sort of um, tightness of, uh, of opportunity and cash just drives creativity. So I think, um, you know, make sure you have a long runway, make sure you really continually reassess your costs, mm. but actually think about what is the problem you're trying to solve and really stick to that business user case um, that I was talking about in general for luxury, but I think it applies to, to anything. What are you trying to solve and really um, focus, focus. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity actually. And these, these are times we've seen it from the last financial crisis. These are times when some of uh, the best businesses are built. So um, it's, it's an exciting space. That's great. Well, fantastic words to end on. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to all of you as well.